Good evening, blessings to all of you. I am Luisa Mendoza and I bring you a lesson this evening. The title of this lesson is What Will You Decide About Jesus? And it's based on Mark chapter 14 verses 60 to 64 and then we're going to read a little bit from Mark chapter 15 verses 2 to 15. To begin this lesson, I have something interesting to ask you. Let's pretend for a moment that an alien arrived to Earth and you are given the responsibility to introduce this alien with Earth's culture. What will you tell him about things of our everyday life? For example, can you describe what is ice cream? Can you describe what is a television? Can you describe love? What could you tell him about the Lord Jesus Christ? The truth is that nowadays many people don't know about Jesus. So how could you describe Jesus Christ? How could you talk about God to someone who doesn't know anything about Jesus. And I think the most important question that I would like to ask you is what could you tell this person about your decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Why are you a Christian believer? If you can express it in words that could be easily understood by an alien or a young child, then you would be prepared, you would be ready to share your testimony about Jesus Christ. What I could tell a person who doesn't know about Jesus Christ is that I grew up in a home where there was no love, no affection, or at least that's how I felt. And a young man, a young preacher said from the pulpit, Jesus loves you. That transformed my life. That transformed my destiny. So for me, that is the reason why I follow Jesus. That's why I believe in Jesus, because his love completely transformed me. I only knew that he loved me, but later on when I knew that Jesus died on a cross, to pay for my sins, my love was even greater and I made a decision not only to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but to follow him, to do his will, to obey him. Amen. My brothers, my sisters, I would like this evening to talk to you about several people that they have to decide about the Lord Jesus Christ and today we still need to make that decision what will we decide about Jesus to begin I would like to read you some scriptures I'm going to read Mark 14 verses 60 to 64 then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the son of the Blessed One? I am, Jesus said, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? I would like to talk very briefly about the Sanhedrin and that was the Supreme Court of the Jews. In just a few verses before what I read, 
in Mark 14, 55, tells us that the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. The religious leaders brought in false witnesses to testify against Jesus. The high priest demanded that Jesus respond to their accusations against him. Let me ask you this. What would you do if you were falsely accused and they bring false witnesses to speak against you? How would you respond to that? I can tell you my own story. When someone spoke so evil against me, my first reaction was to defend myself, to confront that person. And whenever other people confronted me about the falsehood that was being said about me, I tried to defend myself. And I learned that that's not the best way I should respond to false accusations or to, or to false witnesses. Here we see Jesus. He remained silent. He did not answer anything to defend himself. And I truly understand that that's the best way to respond to false accusations or slander or any person speaking evil about me. Why? Because when you do that, you are turning this situation completely to God for him to defend you. You don't have to defend yourself anymore. Let me read a little bit about what our lesson says throughout Mark's gospel Jesus did not want to speak plainly about his identity as the Messiah he even prevented the evil spirits whom he cast out from proclaiming his identity as the Holy One of God and that's in Mark chapter 2 verse 24 there is another piece of information that helps us understand what the high priest meant by saying the son of the blessed one. That simply means the son of God. Because the Jews, they didn't even want to use the word God. That's why we see it G slash D. They don't even want to write it in the way we normally do because they wanted to avoid breaking the third commandment that is using the name of the Lord in vain. That's the reason why they said son of the blessed one, but they meant son of the living God. Amen. Amen. So the high priest gets to the heart of the matter and the heart of Jesus' identity. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus' response is amazing. I am. That's all that Jesus said. Why do you think Jesus gives an answer here and not to any of the prior questions? First of all, I believe that Jesus didn't give an answer to the false accusations because they were all lies. Why would he stoop down to the level of these people lying and concocting all these um, uh, stories that were all false? So why would he respond to that? But at the same time, Jesus, before he would speak about himself, not in terms of being the Messiah, but this moment with the high priest, with all the Jewish authorities, it was the proper time for him to reveal his complete and his true identity as the Messiah, the Son of God. Yes. Uh, Pastor Luis, I, I, I also think that Jesus, Jesus was not able to lie he, he was not going to avoid or 
misdirect an answer of that caliber. He was asked point blank, are you the son of the of the blessed one? Amen. And he he is all truth. So in him lies truth and he could only answer with truth. Amen. And as you said, all the all the other uh, um, accusations were just uh, a bunch of concocted lies. So as you said, why even give any thought about that? But exactly. when he was asked point blank about the very truth of the whole thing, he had no other choice but to answer with truth. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Raul. I would also like to continue with what Jesus responded. And he said, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus' words combined a messianic passage from Psalm 110 with an apocalyptic passage of judgment from Daniel 7. His words prophesied a coming time when the roles would be reversed so that those who were now judging unjustly and fairly, they would be judged by the just God. Amen. 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 So, as we see, what had the high priest said about Jesus in the last verse that, that we read when he tore his clothes and he said he's blaspheming? What did the high priest decide about Jesus? It is very sad to say that the high priest, the man that was supposed to be in such relationship with God, he was supposed to have been anointed by the Spirit of God. But this man rejected Jesus. He hated Jesus to the point of wanting to kill him. He rejected Jesus. In these few verses that we read, what stands out to you most from this exchange between the high priest? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus responds, I am. What stands out to you? To me, it was very sad to read that Jesus is revealing himself. Like Brother Raul said, he is saying the whole truth about himself. Yes, he is the Son of God. And a Son of God, he is God himself. And what is the response from the religious authority? It's hatred, lies, bringing false witnesses. In other words, the integrity of the high priest is in shambles because of the hatred that he harbored in his heart. Let's continue with the reading of our scripture for today. And we're going to go to Mark 15 and we're reading verses 2 to 5. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things that they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. The Jewish authorities had reached a decision. Jesus was worthy of death for blasphemy. But they couldn't act upon that judgment, upon that decision, because they themselves could not impose the death penalty. And we're going to read a little bit from our Sunday school lesson. And it says, 
Roman law forbade local consuls from carrying out the death penalty. Therefore, they brought Jesus to Pilate, the Roman military governor over Judea. Jesus appeared before Pilate, bound by chains and bloodied by his own Jewish compatriots. I made some notes from a sermon that I wrote last Easter, and I would like to briefly talk about Pilate. Pontius Pilate is known secularly as a cruel man, as a corrupt person and an oppressor. He habitually insulted the Jewish people in Jerusalem, bringing pagan images. There were other Roman authorities that they were mindful about the commandment that says you will not make images of anything. And they wouldn't bring any of those images into Jerusalem, especially because it's the holy city. But Pontius Pilate didn't have any problems. He brought statues, he brought insignias with images of all kinds. And that was really an abomination for the Jewish people. Unfortunately, today we have lowered our standards that we allow so many images of so many kinds, even inside our temples. We allow them in our Bibles, in our Sunday schools and Bible studies. We should be mindful about the scripture that says you should not make any kind of images. And of course, the worst thing it would be to worship them, to worship these images. But that's how Pontius Pilate offended, insulted the Jewish people. In Luke 13, 1, tells us that there were some men from Galilee that they were killed by Pilate's orders. The problem is that it happened probably inside the temple and most likely at the time of the sacrifice. We have some documents that say that a group of Samaritan men presented charges against Pontius Pilate before the Roman emperor because Pilate executed prisoners without a fair trial. Many times the people that he ordered to be executed hadn't been condemned to death, but Pilate still ordered their deaths. That is the reason why the Jewish leaders were very confident that Pilate was going to condemn Jesus to death. We're going to continue with the scripture, but we're going to read Mark 15, verses 6 to 15. Now, it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. In this scripture, in verse 10, we see that 
Pilate knows the reason why the Jewish authorities wanted Jesus crucified. He wanted him dead. And it's a very simple word, but it's a horrifying word. Envy. Do you know what is envy? I'm going to read it to you because it's a little long. Envy is the resentment, the unsatisfied desire to have what another person has. Another person's possessions, another's position, another's achievement, riches, another person's success. The Bible condemns envy and establishes that the envious will not enter into God's kingdom. Envy. That is a horrifying word. That's the reason why they wanted to kill Jesus. If you would allow me, I have a few more things that I would like to read to you. One needs to recognize the significant irony present in this tragic account. Whereas Jesus was falsely accused as a rebel, Barabbas was a renowned political revolutionary who was guilty of murder. Likewise, the chief priests accused and condemned Jesus for claiming he was the Son of God, the Father, while they sought the release of Barabbas, whose name literally means a son of a father. That's the meaning of the name Barabbas. I would like to read a little bit more to you from a lesson. Let's remember that Pilate asked the Lord Jesus Christ, are you the king of the Jews? And in John 18 verse 34, Jesus responded with another question, and that will help us understand why this question, are you the king of the Jews, is important. Jesus asked Pilate, are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this about me? If the idea about the king of the Jews came from Pilate, it meant, are you an insurrectionist? Are you a rebel against the Roman Empire? That's the meaning of the question. But if Pilate was asking if Jesus was the king of the Jews, it wasn't in a political manner. It was more on a religious sense. So Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And that's in John 18, verse 36. In other words, Jesus was telling Pilate, I am not a threat to you or to the Roman Empire. Mm. My brother, my sister, my friends, Jesus wants to be the king of your life but not to deliver you from conquerors or from colonizers or from people who oppress. Jesus Christ came, sent by the Father to deliver us from our worst enemies. The first worst enemy is sin. The second is death because Jesus offers eternal life. Mm -hmm. And the last one is Satan. Mm -hmm. I think the most important question this evening for all of us, the most important question that I would like to ask you this evening, is Jesus the king 
of your life. Mm. Brother Raul, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add to it. When Pontius Pilate was questioning Jesus, there's also an exchange between the both of them in which Pontius Pilate says, don't you know I have the power to release you? Don't you know I have the power to save you from all this? And, and, and the Lord Jesus, with all confidence, with all confidence, responds, the only power that you have is the one that my Father has given to you. So he was no stranger to what real power was. Amen. Real power. Amen. And, and again, uh, uh, what you mentioned, what you alluded to, uh, as far as not being a threat to Pontius Pilate, not being a threat to the Caesar, to the Roman Empire. He, he plainly told him, it, my, my kingdom is not from here. So he was speaking about things higher than here, higher than. Yes. It's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Raul. We see that the scripture is very clear about who Barabbas was. He was a murderer. He was an insurrectionist. He was a rebel. Do you think that Pilate thought of Jesus and Barabbas as insurrectionists? Do you think Jesus, I mean, Pilate saw Jesus and Barabbas at the same level, just as people who want to rebel against the Roman Empire? I think Pilate realized that the people, the supposed witnesses were just liars. The ones that testified against Jesus. That's why he was amazed at Jesus' silence because he knew what could anybody say to defend against lies? Nothing. We can't defend against that. Do you think that the crowds can be reasoned with? Can we reason with a crowd? No, definitely not. And uh, I think the next question, whom did the crowds choose? We, we know it, we just read it. They chose Barabbas, a criminal. And they rejected Jesus, the Son of God. That's why this question, what will you decide about Jesus, is the most important question that you can ask yourself for your life. So, how does the crowd respond when Pilate asks, what crime has Jesus committed? What can we say about that? Let me read what our Bible study says. Pilate tried to reason with the crowd by challenging them to identify any crime Jesus committed. But they only shouted all the louder for Jesus to be crucified. The verdict of the crowd at the instigation of the Jewish religious leaders was a travesty of justice, baseless and without merit. Based on peer pressure alone, they rejected and condemned Jesus without even knowing or considering him. That's very hard to, to handle. Is there ever a danger for us believers to get caught up in a crowd mentality? Unfortunately, yes. Yes, we, we can get caught up in the crowd mentality and unfortunately, the way of thinking of many people today is against Jesus, is against the word of God, is against the people of God. And many Christians, we're following this. Just this month, I had heard how we Christians are so divided and people outside Christianity are thinking, are, are considering this division and they are wondering 
Why would we believe in God? Why would we go to church if they are so divided? And why would we even become Christians? Exactly. Exactly. And that's the crowd mentality. We are told, as we read a moment ago, that Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd. Are we ever tempted in wanting to satisfy the crowd? Unfortunately, that's another thing that, yes, I'm sorry, I'm very sad to say, yes, we do. To conclude this lesson, I would like to connect this lesson from the Gospel of Mark into our lives today. And let me ask you this question. What would you say led you to make a decision for Christ? Why do you follow Jesus? Going back to the lesson, what do you think led the crowd, led the high priests, and led Pontius Pilate to choose against Jesus? For the crowd, what led them to choose against Jesus was peer pressure. When we see what our young people are doing, we are no one to judge them because we have done the same thing. They follow the crowd because of peer pressure. And in many instances, we adults, we do the same thing. And that's why they chose against Jesus because they followed the crowd as for Pilate is concerned as we read in the scripture Mark tells us very clearly that the only reason why he chose against Jesus is because he wanted to please the crowds he wanted to look good in front of them so he did what they wanted Pilate to do with Jesus crucify him as for the high priest Mark is also very clear in telling us why the high priest chose against Jesus. And it's this horrendous word, envy. Envy. The Bible condemns envy. And the Bible says that people who have envy in their hearts, they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And that is a big warning for each one of us. Each day we encounter people or messages that are contrary to the message of the gospel. They deny Jesus by the things they say and the things they do. I think this year 2023 through the media you have seen, I'm sure you have heard in movies and events that are going around the world, even the carnival in Brazil and many other events, how we are trying to make a mockery of Jesus and of Christianity. We deny Jesus. So how can we resist these cultural crowds that attempt to lead us to deny Jesus. What can we do? My brothers, my sisters, the best thing you can do is to remain in communion, in fellowship every day with our Heavenly Father. Pray every day, even if it is for a moment or two throughout the day. Pray, be in communion with your heavenly father read the bible know what god thinks about all the issues that matter to you and that matter in this world today and be in fellowship with other christian believers that are um, knowledgeable about the scriptures that you know that they are true christian believers amen, amen. How are people forming their decisions about Jesus today? Unfortunately, 
the media is doing a lot of harm as for us making a decision about Jesus and about Christian believers. They show Jesus as a weak person that was defeated in a cross and he's dead. Or they are trying to make him look like he was so weak he couldn't even defend himself. He couldn't say anything and, and Satan was even dancing with joy because uh, he defeated Jesus. That is not the end of the story. In a few more days, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Jesus himself told the high priest and other people that denied him, we are going to see him coming in the clouds of heaven, victorious, victorious. That is the end of the story. Yes. The victory of Jesus Christ and of all those that have put their faith in him. Hallelujah. That's right. Think about your life. How would you finish this sentence? I follow Jesus because I love him. Amen. Amen. Above all things, above everyone. Hallelujah. I follow Jesus because he loved me first. Oh, thank you. And I also love him. And I want to please him. I want to live the rest of my life to thank him for dying on the cross of Calvary to save me, to save my family, to save my loved ones. Think about the church. In what ways can the church go against these cultural crowds and proclaim the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ in our community. I think the best way as a church that we can proclaim that Jesus Christ is King is by living a life dedicated to Him, to love Him, to serve Him, to obey Him, by loving, serving other people. Thank you very much. May the Lord greatly bless you.